<coughs> Good evening. Assalamu alaikum. So, um, I, I want to begin by extending my gratitude to everyone who has worked very hard to make this possible and to all of you who could be doing anything else with your time this evening but have decided to join us for this conversation. So thank you. Um, and to the Institute as well for, for inviting me and being insistent and making sure that I could make it. Um, I also have to say it has been a really uh, a remarkable day for me to, hear, to get a lot of support from various dignitaries who are present here and I'll thank them but in particular from dignitaries from the African continent. We have the ambassador from Egypt here earlier, the Sierra Union ambassador was here and had lunch with us. So it's been really wonderful to see this new wave of support <laughs> but for to young people in the African continent that uh, we are getting used to to some extent. Anyway, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to begin, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a writer and uh, perhaps before I became a writer, I was a storyteller. So I would just tell a story about who I am, how I came to be. And in the telling of that story, I do hope to illustrate certain points about uh, resilience, but uh, about tenacity, about uh, the fact that um, talent is universal and opportunities are not. And the only difference between a child in Sudan or in Colombia who's struggling, or any, and for that matter, in the world, is because they may not have the right opportunities. When they do, they would rise to the occasion and make changes in their lives and become useful human beings. But let me start from the beginning. As you heard in the introduction, I was born in Sierra Leone, um, a small country in West Africa that prior to the 90s, really, uh, we were a very quiet nation. Most people did not know much about us. In fact, to the point that when I started, when I left my own country and I would try to talk to people about Sierra Leone, <laughs> I had to introduce, particularly in the United States, I had to introduce Sierra Leone via way of Liberia because Liberia had a direct yeah, historical relationship to the United States. And people would say, yes, we've heard of Liberia. Monrovia, is that the one? And I say, yes, we are next to that. So this is kind of how I introduced uh, my country. Um, but we became notorious in the world because of the war we had. But that's not the entire history of Sierra Leone. I was born, as you heard, in 1980 in the southern part of the country. And Sierra Leone is a former British colony, so I, it, there was a very strong and still a very strong love for education. So as a second born in a family of three, um, I, um, my father was very harsh in education as a boy growing up. In this small village that I grew up, I still went to school. Um, but even before I went to school, there are other things in my life, I think, that were preparing me for what later came, and perhaps to strengthen my spirit to withstand whatever life would throw at me. And one of them was oral tradition storytelling. It was very much heavily part of my upbringing as a child. I grew up in a village where every evening we'd sit around the fire, and the elder people, particularly the grandmothers, and then the grandfathers, would tell a story to the young people. And one of the important aspects of oral tradition is that it really fosters an active listening. Uh, when you're being told a story orally, you're not taking a note, so you have to listen and imagine the word that's being created for you. And the way they tested this in children was that at the telling of another story, you'd be randomly called upon to retell a story that had been told. So if you did not listen, you could not tell the story. And if you grew up in the small village that I grew up in, you did not want to be known as the child who doesn't listen. That, basically became your character for the rest of your life. So everybody paid attention uh, deeply. So as a boy, this was kind of my life. I, I came to understand from my grandmother that stories are medicine. Uh, they are medicines that uh, pour into us to prepare us for what life may throw at us. Or to paraphrase from, from the Mende saying, which is my tribe, that stories are medicine poured into us so that when life breaks us, we'll be able to rebuild ourselves again. Our life is not able to break us completely. It may bend us a little bit, but we'll stand up again. Um, this was the early beginning of my life. So I grew up in this village where everybody knew everyone. I walked six, seven miles to my grandmother's village without fearing anything. Life was beautiful, simple and remarkably beautiful. In addition to this, my father was educated to university level. He worked for an American mining company and I, before I went to school, I started hearing English from my father. 
Uh, he was one of those people, when he would get upset in the community, he would speak English. Uh, so my very early words that I learned in English were not very good ones because of that. Uh, and I would say to him, well, what did you say? And he would say, well, when you're old enough, when you can read English, you'll find out. And when I found out, I, I understood where <laughs> it was coming from. But my father also did something um, uh, before I even went to school that uh, trained the way I looked at the world and, and, and consumed information. He had this game that he would play with my older brother and I. Now we are a family of three, all boys, uh, and my parents separated when I was very young, which is very unusual in the community that I grew up in. Hence, people are always saying things to my father that made him react in English. Um, I would um, sit on my, on my um, um, so my older brother and I stayed with our father, and then my younger brother went with our mother just the next town. Uh, and so my father would play this game with us, particularly me because I came to love this game where he would make me sit on his shoulders. And he would tell me, we're going to pretend that I am a blind man and you are my guide. I've been blind since birth, so I don't know how the world looks, so you have to describe it to me and make me feel it, understand it. So for example, he would start walking to a fire and I would say, well, don't go in the fire. And he would say, well, what is fire? I'd be like, you know, everybody knows fire. It can burn you. <laughs> like, well, I don't know. I'm a blind man. I've never seen it. So in my little young mind, I would try very hard to describe what it felt like, what it looked like, the color, and things like that. And then he would avoid it if he understood what it was. <laughs> Otherwise, he would really go very close to it to the point that I was trying to jump off, you know. <laughs> um, in addition to this, uh, my grandfather uh, was an imam in our village. So even before I went to school, I was already learning Arabic a little bit and the prayers and things like that. So I actually grew up in a mosque calling Azan and all these things when I was a boy. And then I went to school uh, um, when I was of age. And um, in the uh, former British colonies, as soon as you know how to speak, read and write English, at least in my con context, Shakespeare is forced upon you to some extent until you submit. <laughs> <laughs> to loving it, whether you like it or not. So that became another aspect of my life where Shakespeare, you know, I even knew how to say friends, Romans, countrymen, let me your ears have come to bury Caesar. Uh, without knowing what it meant. In the beginning, I knew how it sounded. <laughs> and later on, and I grew up in this context where uh, parents were really proud when their, uh, their, their, their children spoke English. And so they will show you off, you know. So my father would take me to the village square and he would say, get up there and, and give me a, a learn for Macbeth, you know. And then I would go on, you know. And everybody would be like, oh, this one is really smart. Like, I don't even know what it is that I'm talking about. Um, but, um, and then, you know, of course, grew up playing football, all of these things. So I, I'm just giving you really the context of my life before all of this. A last addition to all of these things was that because my father worked for this American mining company, uh, uh, came American popular culture. Uh, we didn't have electricity where I grew up, but the mining quarters uh, where we had access to, because my father worked for the company, uh, had a common area where they had these televisions mounted. And so we would go there, and then we started seeing this Run DMC, or this American, you know, people who looked like us, black and who were very versatile in English, they were speaking really fast. So we got really taken to that. Uh, and so we started embracing hip hop as another form of, but this was back in the day when hip hop music had a message, not currently uh, in this situation. <laughs> but um, so we started listening to the lyrics, we would look in the dictionary for words we didn't know. My father obviously was against this because he felt our proper British English was going to be spoiled by <laughs> the uncoming of this new thing. So anyway, this was basically my life as a boy, uh, uninterrupted, you know. I started going to talent shows with my older brother, would dance like the MC had my haircuts we had and all that stuff. Um, and the reason why these things are important because I think when, when people hear from others far away, oftentimes uh, we don't know the context of their lives. We don't know that it's so similar to ours that we're willing to you know, believe anything we're told. Um, at the same time, while I was, I was growing up, people who were my age were experiencing this music, the world, in the same way I was, even though I was not even close to them, at least that's what they, they thought. Now, um, then the war started in the neighboring Liberia, and we started hearing about it. Uh, 
And we started seeing people running from the war and coming to our town, and they would explain to us what had happened to them. Uh, we could not even imagine that was possible. Even, in fact, some of us said, well, this will never happen in Sierra Leone. Uh, we don't know what happened to them in Liberia, but we are really nice people. We love each other. You know, we take care of each other. You know, if, you know, we eat together. We have all these traditions. This is never going to happen here. Then the war started in the eastern part of Sierra Leone, and we started seeing Sierra Leoneans who spoke the same language, looked like us, running, and they would come, and they would talk about how their houses have been burnt down, their children recruited, uh, how they'd lost everything in an instant, their life had completely collapsed, and we still did not believe them. And eventually the war reached my part of the country. I was 12 years old, and everything I knew, oh, I grew up as a boy, even though I, I love Shakespeare and all of these things, my father wanted me to be an economist, and so I was studying to, to you know, be, I knew this would never be possible because my math skills were next to nothing. <laughs> but nonetheless, I pushed. Um, so. My life went from this boy who was running around, playing football, loving Shakespeare, American hip hop, having this simple, beautiful life, to one now who had to be introduced to war. And I had no idea. I don't think any parents sit their child down and prepare them for these kinds of things because you don't want to even uh, entertain the idea that this is a possibility. Uh, I had gone to another town with my older brother for a talent show when the war reached my town. And we started going against the tide of people who were running from the war. And this is the first time in my life that I really understood what war was, and I began to understand, at least. Um, prior to that, anything I'd seen about war was a Rambo film or something like that. And as we were running, we saw people uh, running away from their lives, basically, with nothing. Um, some of them did not even have a shirt on. And, but there are a few, two moments on that particular day that really drove home the point to me that this place that I once felt safe at, that I knew as a child, had changed remarkably. Uh, and not for the worse at that time, at least. Uh, was that we saw a, a man, an older man, who was carrying his son in his arms, and the son had been completely shot up. Uh, he, he, his body was basically shattered with bullets. And he was running with his child, holding his arm and crying. It was the first time i would seen a man, a grown man, cry helplessly. And that really uh, affected me, because I'd never seen that in my community. And, and the child was dead, but nobody wanted to tell him. Because the fact that he was trying to find an hospital kept him away from the war. So nobody wanted to tell him that, because he would have just stopped and, and given up. Uh, and the second thing that we saw that was equally uh, devastating was back home um, um, in Sierra Leone and other African countries, in this case I would generalize, um, women wear a wrapper around them to carry their baby so that their hands would be free while they're going about their daily task. So there was a, a, a mother who was running and her child was tied behind her back from the wall. She had been running and when she stopped at where we were standing, she removed her child and it was a, a baby girl, uh, some months old. And the baby had been killed. There was a bullet in the back of the baby. And the only reason why the mother had survived was because she was carrying the child. And if you're a parent, you can imagine what that pain was. I saw the pain on this woman's face. And even more devastatingly was that uh, the baby had been smiling because when the mother was running, so the, the interrupted smile was on the baby's face. And these two images just really made me understand that this place was no longer the same. Um, that even once innocence had become uh, a threat. Uh, from that day on, I started running from the war uh, with my older brother at first, and then we were separated. Now, what happened in the war in Sierra Leone was that at some point, all the groups started recruiting children, including the National Army. Um, and some of the, recruit, the, the methodologies, particularly from the rebel group, was to disrupt the community structure. And how to do that was when you were captured, you were forced to inflict violence on your community. So basically, a child was given a gun and asked to kill their grandfather or their grandmother or their mother in front of everybody else in the community. And when this happened, that child can no longer return. Uh, that child becomes beholden to the group that did that to them. But also, another part that was really quite difficult was that the adults who survived these experiences no longer saw children as these innocent beings running. So they feared children. So imagine, 
you are 12, 13 running for your life. And when you come into a town, I was running with a group of kids, all the adults, everybody start to run away from you because they cannot determine anymore whether you're a child or whether you're part of one of these groups. So you're shouting at people, be like, no, we're not part of any group. And sometimes if they can run, they try to attack you. So my life became really difficult along with everybody who was young in Sierra Leone where you avoided towns and villages as you were running from this war because you don't know who is going to be there and whether they will attack you, whether they will believe that you're just a kid. Uh, and by avoiding these towns and villages meant not having access to water, to food, or anything like that. So we started to go hungry as well. Um, I ran basically every day. Also, in those days, <laughs> there were no smartphones or anything like that. So you didn't have Google Map telling you go left, go right, or wherever, whatever the case may be. And for some of us, because of how the, the country was, we had not really left our area of the country. There was no need to go to the capital city or anywhere else. So we actually had no way of knowing which way we were going. We basically just ran away from the gunshots. If the gunshots came left, we went right. They came from behind us, we went forward. And so every day we learned to function in the course of this madness. And immediately as a child, you learn to think as an adult because you have to take care of your own life. For example, we learned that it was better to run from the war during the nighttime. Because if there were fights going on, you could see the explosions in the bullets more clearly than if you ran during the daytime, stray bullets could struck you and kill you. And it happened to some of the kids who were running from. Um, we learned not to sleep in towns, abandoned towns and villages. Even though the beds look comfortable at night, if they attacked it, they would burn everything down and you would be burned alive as well. So we learned to sleep in bushes and climb trees and do different things that we did not have we had not been trained for, but somehow the desire to survive uh, was there. And me, for me particularly early on, the desire to survive was because I, um, I wanted to find my family. And I was with a group of other kids and they all had the same desire. As we ran from this war between uh, 12 and 13, I had seen things that I never imagined. Uh, the paths in the up, up country that used to be beautiful to walk on, uh, we're now littered with dead bodies. If you went to the river, uh, you could not even find the water. You have to push blood and body to get to the water. This sort of was the, the visual that we were seeing. And in addition to that, um, as we, we are running from this war also, uh, you, you, st you begin to, to realize that you have to shut down. If you allow yourself to feel anything, it would weaken your resolve. So if a friend of ours was killed along the way, we basically uh, have to move on very quickly uh, and not really try to feel that emotion because you, you, know, you, you will not be able to take it. Um, so constantly we're running from this war. And then between that time, 12 and 13, my immediate family, I lost them in the war. So my mother, father, and two brothers uh, were completely gone because an attack happened and I was only minutes away. Otherwise, I would not be alive myself. Uh, and that really shattered me completely. I felt there was no reason to go on anymore. What's the point? Um, I had no home to go to. I had no family to go to. And I was with other groups of kids who also were in a similar situation. Um, somehow we gave each other strength. We decided to go to a military base, thinking that this was the safest place to go. The military would protect you. But what we did not know was that through the course of the war, as we'd been running from it, even the military had splintered. There were certain parts of it they were no longer adhering to central command. They were basically doing whatever they wanted. Uh, in Sierra Leone, the term was called uh, so belt, so soldiers would behave like rebels. We went to one of these bases, and we stayed there in the beginning for shelter, for food, for various things. And then this is where uh, we were recruited. I was 13 at the time. Um, I did not think anybody would recruit me to fight in a war. Um, I was a very, <laughs> some kids were bigger than I was, and I thought nobody's going to, you know. Um, but uh, we were trained, basically, um, uh, in the midst of the war. Uh, now, as a military person, you were trained for years before you even see combat. We did not have that luxury. While we were training, we were here in war, and we were seeing the soldiers being brought back or being killed. So basically, we knew we'd be going very shortly. We had a week of training. Between that week, and the thing that we only knew how to do was that during the training, they would give you a ration of food to eat, and they would count to 60 seconds. If you didn't finish eating, they would take it away from you. So the only thing we mastered was to eat any food in 60 seconds. <laughs> uh, 
uh, and a few commands, and basically you went to war to practice whatever you had been taught. Now there are various things that were being used. All of us were angry because we had lost family. So they used that to say the other people are responsible for your loss, and therefore we must stop them. Somebody must be responsible for what had happened to you, and also to prevent this from happening to other children. And obviously we're angry, we believe that. Uh, and the second part was that once you started fighting, you got traumatized, there are some drugs used, you, got, you, you became addicted to the violence itself as a way to cope with what you had seen and what was going on. So I went from this boy that I described to you earlier to now this soldier, hardened soldier, I was a lieutenant in the, uh, at some point in the war, uh, to basically having, they call them small boy units, so basically a boy who controls a group of other soldiers uh, to do whatever the commander wants. Um, um, I, I didn't think my life would be possible in any other way but to remain in this war until probably I died. And I was ready for that because I'd lost everything. Now, I'll make a point here. Most people, when they talk about how children are recruited, they ask the question, why children? Um, children are very effective soldiers, particularly if you brainwash them to believe, they will believe anything. They're still forming, so they will believe anything that you want them to believe. And for particularly the children who have lost everything, they, have, they don't care about anything. They basically can go anywhere and jump into any fight and create any ambush. They will do anything. And strangely enough also, this group became our new community. So it was a false sense of the community we used to have. Now our elder brothers were the commanders, uncles, you know, all these things. So we stayed for that, but we also stayed for the kids we had joined with, that we had run with, we had lost things together with, to protect each other. And so you find yourself staying in this madness because of that. Um, I was in this war for nearly three years. Uh, war was all I knew, I fought almost every day. And the war in Sierra Leone was particularly violent um, in all kinds of you know, crazy ways. Um, and that's all I knew. Um, I stopped feeling, I forgot how to even sleep properly. Um, I just became a soldier who just, um, killing or, war or people killed around me was no longer something that disturbed my spirit as it did in the beginning of the war. Um, I completely shut down. Um, then one day while I was at this, one of the bases, um, um, a, um, a, um, a few people showed up. Um, now, when you're uh, in guerrilla warfare, you're constantly in the bush running. You could smell people coming from the capital city over 100 miles away. Because they're wearing clean clothes, you could basically smell them. Uh, so we saw these people who came, and they had jeans, and they had these t-shirts that said UNICEF on it. I'd never heard of them before. <laughs> I'd never, you know. So my initial reaction was like, oh, maybe this is another mercenary group we're going to have to walk with, you know? But we, we're looking at them and I thought the logo they had was somebody holding the baby. I was like, well, what kind of mercenary group can have a logo with a child on it? Eh, maybe you never know, things are strange these days. But um, they were speaking to the commanders and uh, they had been, from their body language, I could tell that it wasn't the first time. Uh, when a civilian enters a conflict zone for the first time, their body language gives them away. But if they've come a bit, you see how they react. So anyway. Um, they talked to the commanders and they decided to disarm a few people. Um, basically because people had agreed that the war in Sierra Leone had gone on too long and they needed to stop it and therefore they needed to start releasing children from these groups. Um, because I looked more like a child, uh, there was no denying it, I was disarmed that day. I wasn't disarmed because my commander felt sorry for me or anything like that. And I was reluctant to go because I knew very well in, the, in this context that I knew of my country now, if you didn't have a gun, you were not part of a fighting group, you basically became prey to everybody. So, and I was looking at these people, I was like, what would they do if somebody attacked me, when, if they take away my weapon now? Anyway, I didn't have any choice because it was a command, and obviously we're still at the war front, so if you resist command, some certain things could happen to you. So I left with them, and they took us to the capital city of my country, Freetown, the outside. It's the first time in my life that I'd been to my country's capital city, and they put us in a rehabilitation center. Uh, and this was the, the, the beginning, really, of a turning point in my life. At the rehabilitation center, uh, people did not know what to do with us. 
In Sierra Leone, before the war, we had one psychologist, a fellow who passed away now, Dr. Tamba Maturi. Uh, he was only one guy, so I guess maybe we didn't have psychological issues in Sierra Leone before the war. Uh, so he, he couldn't do the job alone, so he basically gave a crash course about psychiatry to a few people, willing people, who wanted to do something, and they were the staff uh, at the center, Sierra Leoneans. Uh, what was very true was that these people cared about us. They saw us as children and wanted us to change and everything they learned on the job. Now imagine coming to work to help people who basically are waiting to kill you. It is not a very easy thing to do. And when they came to work with us, because the war was still going on, most people in the capital city who had not experienced it uh, did not understand the context of what our lives had been. So they thought we were only killers. So the people who came to help us, when they left and went back to the community, the community actually attacked them because it was like, why are you working with the killers? And there you go to work and the kids are waiting to also attack you. So I couldn't imagine doing that kind of work, but they did. And in the beginning, we would not listen to anybody because we had also developed the sense that there was a strong difference between a combatant and a civilian. Civilians, you can listen to them. You do whatever you want to them. So when they would come to us and say, hey, you know, you have to go to therapy, you have to go to school, we would chase them. Sometimes we beat them up, we wound them. They would go home and some of them would come back with bandaged arm, head. And the first thing they would ask is like, so how are you guys doing today? So we started thinking to ourselves, well, these people must be more traumatized than we are if they keep coming back, you know. Why are they so crazy? So this curiosity to understand why do they keep coming back? when we don't want them to come back. What is wrong with these people? Uh, started this process of us sort of observing them a little bit. Um, at the center, as I mentioned earlier, they didn't have formal training about um, how to really deal with children uh, from war. So basically they decided to come up with various things, combining uh, Western ideas of, psycho uh, of, of uh, psychology of therapy to uh, just local ideas and things like that. So one of the things that was a common ground was that they realized maybe we'll get them to go to school. So we see who had been where in school before the war. So they gave us supplies, books, and pens and pencils, and we made campfire with everything and we burn it down. <laughs> so they gave us some more. Uh, eventually we were like, all right, we don't want to burn these things down anymore. We had a guy amongst us, Al Haji, who was an entrepreneur. He said, Let's not burn them. How about if we, skip the, we escape the center and go sell them? I'm sure people want them. We can make some money. So we did, you know. We sold them, and obviously with money in our hand, we're all crazy in the head. It was not a good situation. Uh, so they went into the community and told the traders not to buy from us. Uh, so eventually uh, they decided, okay, these people want to go to town. So we're going to make trips to town, but only if you come to class. And then some of us started going to class. For example, because I was a commander in my group, some of the kids that had come out of the war with, uh, they realized that they wouldn't listen to anything. So they would challenge me and say, but you're a terrible commander. You know, you can't get your boys to even go to school. And I would say to them, okay, everybody, let's go to school. And then they would go. <laughs> so, so they had different ways of getting to us. And another thing was that we played, we played football or soccer. And um, we all grew up playing soccer. So when they said there was a soccer match, we all went to play. Uh, and when, but when a team came and played against us, if they won, the whole neighborhood was in trouble for days. We chased everybody around and had a huge fight. So all of a sudden, we started winning these football matches. you know. And when we won them, we would be happy for the next three days, and just talking about it. So for a number of years, I went on thinking that I was this really amazing footballer. <laughs> but realizing that they actually fixed the matches because they thought it was beneficial. So these teams would come and pretend to really play well, and then they would lose to us. You know? And then we would talk about it. And why we were happy, we would talk about when we played before the war, when we played during the war, so, and we would give up information that was necessary for them to know how to deal with us. And another aspect of it was that they realized in these makeshift classes, instead of trying to teach us, they would ask us questions about what we used to love. Obviously, everybody started reciting Shakespeare left and right who had gone to school. And so they started a little drama club. And so people would fight to talk about Shakespeare. I know Shakespeare more than you. Um, I, I loved hip hop and I loved music in general. So a nurse who was working at the center became one of the people assigned to me, Esther who was the first adult that I started trusting after this experience. She basically decided, okay, how I can get to him is to find him the music he had lost, which is the Bob Marley, the Ron DMCs, the LL Cool J's, 
Uh, back in the day, for the young audience, we had this thing they call cassettes. Uh, I'm not sure some of you even know what that is. <laughs> and a Walkman that you put in and you rewind with your pen so you won't waste your battery. Um, so she would go out and buy me cassettes and a Walkman, and so we'd listen together and write the lyrics. And so then I would accidentally tell her things I didn't want to. So, but then I would hold back. So slowly I began to open up. Obviously, in addition to this, there was also some uh, uh, psychosocial therapy, some administration of drugs, because some, some medicine, because sometimes we were still withdrawing from the drugs and sometimes we hurt ourselves and each other. So they would administer some of that so that we can calm down and rest a bit. I spent eight months at the center because the funding was abundant and I was able to recover to some extent, but not fully. I was fit to be put back in society. And one of the things they do is that they do what is called family tracing. So they take you, uh, they look for any member of your family that's still around that they could find. And they found my uncle who lived in the capital city. And so I went to stay with him. Now I mentioned earlier the idea of stigma. My uncle decided not to tell anybody in the community in a place called New Englandville in, in, in Freetown where he, he lived. Because if people found out that I was a former child soldier living in the community, it came with all kinds of problems for him and for me. Um, but eventually people will find out and if something went missing in the community or anything went wrong, it was your fault because you're the former child soldier who lived there. So now we had come from this experience and we were trying to remake ourselves, but there was a disbelief in the possibility of our humanity, of being peaceful. Nobody believed that we could be normal. Um, and therein began another war to convince people that we probably were the people who understood the nature of violence more than anybody else and therefore did not want anything to do with it. But nobody would believe us. Nobody would even talk to us. Even at the rehabilitation center, sometimes there was a sort of a, um, a belittling of our intelligence where you would be sitting there and people would basically talk about you and make plans for your life and you're sitting right there. So we used to think each other, you know, like, um, it takes remarkable strength and intelligence to survive war. How come these people cannot see that? We're sitting here, we have ideas what we want to do with our lives, you know. <laughs> Just because we have been in war, yes, we are not completely sane in the head, but doesn't mean that our intelligence left uh, because of this experience. But anyway, um, so this was very difficult to convince people about this. So while I was living with my uncle, an opportunity came. It was following the study, if you've studied anything about the international uh, legal standards about uh, uh, to prevent war against children or, um, or um, was that a, there was a, a, a very instrumental study by Grasso Marshall called The Impact of Armed Conflict on Children Around the World. And she had gone to places like Sierra Leone, met people like me all over the world where this was an issue and interviewed kids. And there was a conference being held in New York um, for, for that. And they wanted to bring some of the people who had experienced this directly to speak at the Security Council or the General Assembly about it. Um, and I was asked to go for the interview. Um, <laughs> I showed up reluctantly. Uh, I did not trust many people at the time. Um, and in the room, it was filled with a lot of people from the capital city who had not experienced war or were being interviewed to go and speak about the plight of children in Sierra Leone. Um, at the time, we had government systems that were not very good in Sierra Leone, not as it is now. Um, and so people, you know, were still playing those games. And so I was very upset. So I basically, and the only way I knew how to express my anger at the time was, you know, throwing things. And <laughs> so I threw the chairs and basically told people, this is the reason why we had a war. Why are you doing this? And then I left. And then I was selected as one of the, <laughs> the people. So sometimes it helps to protest, but perhaps not in the way that I did it at the time. Uh, so I was selected as one of the two people to go from Sierra Leone to New York uh, to speak about this experience. Um, now, it was the first time in my life that I was supposed to travel outside of Sierra Leone. Uh, a passport in many places around the world is a luxury item. Most people don't have access to it because they can't afford it. It's difficult to acquire. I'd lost everything during the war. Um, I did not have anything really except my life and the family members I was finding little by little. Uh, and they helped me secure a passport. Um, and I went to the American embassy for a visa. And I remember during the conversation is when I think I really began to think that people must know about the context of what it means to be in war. 
because the fellow who was interviewing me through the mirror basically asked me, um, can you, I need two pieces of documents from you to guarantee that you will return to Sierra Leone when you go to the United States at the UN to speak. And I said, well, what, what are these documents? It's like, one, do you have a bank statement that shows how much money you have in the bank? You know? And second, do you have a, 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 a document that show ownership of property? And I said, well, you know, in my village, everybody knows where my grandfather's land is. It's there. <laughs> everybody knows, you know. <laughs> and I realized this is a completely different context. He was like, but I need proof that you have this. And then I said, well, there has been a war here. And let's assume that I had a bank account, right? And I had money in it. And people were shooting guns in my time village. My first thought would be, you know, I should get my bank account, my bank statement. This is the most important thing at this moment to pick up while people are running for their lives. So I made this joke. I'm not sure the fellow had a sense of humor. He did not understand <laughs> what, what I was saying. But because I had the backing of the, of, uh, the UN, I was given this visa. Um, and they bought us these suitcases, uh, big suitcases to travel. I had nothing. I had two pairs of pants. Uh, two shirts, one short sleeve, one long sleeve. I was wearing one of them at the time. So I put the other in this big suitcase and we went to the airport, you know. I gave it to them. I wasn't a seasoned traveler as I am these days to know that I could have taken it on board. You know, I, they checked it in, got on the plane, you know. Um, it was, in those days, it was KLM was flying to Sierra Leone, so it was a KLM flight. We got on the plane. Uh, we were going with a chaperone from Sierra Leone who was in the same situation as we were. He was only older, but he had never left Sierra Leone either. So I don't know why he was our chaperone, but that was the case, you know. <laughs> we were all in the same boat. Uh, we sit on the plane and this thing starts to take off and it's so cold. Uh, we had not received any orientation whatsoever and the whole time I'm thinking to myself, and I was with another friend who now lives in Canada, and we, we were looking at each other thinking, you know, we just survived this war, and we're going to die on this thing, you know? <laughs> this is really not good, you know? This is, this is the worst possible way to go, you know? We could at least put up a fight somewhere, you know? So the whole time we're looking at the exercise, saying, let's jump off, you know, before the thing really leaves the African continent, because at least we knew we'd be guaranteed warm weather wherever we fell, you know, even if we had broken legs. So we had this discussion. Obviously, we did not jump off, but otherwise, you know. So but a flight attendant noticed and brought blankets and told us you could turn the thing down a little bit. So anyway, there was tolerable bit. And then stranger things started to occur. Um, we, um, they decided to serve something. Um, I had never seen this kind of diet before, uh, that they're passing things around. So my friend and I whispered to each other, like, oh, we had no idea these people ate grass. You know, what is it that they're putting on their plate? So out of caution, we said, let's not touch it. Let's watch them eat it and see what happens to them, you know? <laughs> we're back in survival mode. So all these people are eating. The way we later came to know our salad, they ate it, ate it, and then no, after five, 10 minutes, nobody had fallen down. We said, all right, let's try it. We did not like it, absolutely not. You know, uh, it took years for me to <laughs> develop a taste for it. Um, then we landed at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam to switch to a plane to New York. Now, I mentioned earlier that my, my, my father worked for an American mining company, and we had Peace Corps volunteers in Sierra Leone, but all of the white people we had seen, at least I had seen in my life, were men. I had never seen a white person that was not a man. So it was the mining workers and the Peace Corps guys, you know? So all of a sudden, at Schiphol Airport, we started seeing white people that were not men. So we thought to myself, we had no idea they had them in women's version, children's version. <laughs> this is really incredible revelation to us, you know. <laughs> we were, we were. So this whole time, you know, we have this war in our mind, and then there was this whole new world that's just coming at us with nothing, really. And then we landed in New York. It was winter of 1996. It was one of the coldest winters in New York. Uh, and there are things falling out of the sky, white things, you know. Uh, and, I, and it was about 4 p.m., and it was dark. And I said to my friend, you know, I don't trust a country where at 4 p.m. it's already dark. There's something very sinister about this. You know? Why is it like this? You know, we stepped outside. It was cold. I felt my face was going to fall off. We ran back inside. I said, you know, I would like to go back home. So contrary to the belief that I was not looking forward to being in the U.S., it was too cold. And in addition to that, the films that I'd seen about hip-hop videos were people in New York 
gang violence, running around shooting at each other. I thought to myself, I just survived a war. I don't want to be fighting anywhere else. This is the end of it for me. Uh, anyway, we went into Manhattan. We got a hotel room. It's the first time in my life that I had a room that was mine. Um, but I was really cold, but in the room, it was absolutely hot because the radiator was on. Again, I come from a Sierra Leone. Uh, we don't have a need for a, a heater in any of our homes, you know. So I'm looking at it and I thought to myself, this is a really strange, bizarre country. It is incredibly cold outside and it's so hot inside. Where is the in-between? I, I need something, you know, and I noticed earlier that in the hallway of the hotel, uh, the temperature was a bit moderate. It wasn't as hot or as cold as outside. So I took my bed in, put it outside my door with my pillow, and I started sleeping. Now, the context of my life where I was coming from, this was perfect for me. You know, I'd, I'd slept in worse places. So obviously, the hotel security came and be like, no, no, sir, you cannot sleep. I was like, no, this is fine. I've slept in worse places, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, no, you cannot sleep. I was like, well, well my room is really boiling hot. And then, so they explained to me what it was. The next morning, because I knew now that in some parts of the building there are these things where hot air comes out of, each time I walk into a building, I scoped it out. Where is that place where the hot air is coming out of? So I would go and sit next to it because I didn't have a winter jacket at all, none. Uh, so this is how I met my mother, the woman, the American woman who later adopted me. Uh, she was one of the facilitators of this conference, and she saw that uh, my friend and I did not have um, uh, jackets, so she went home and brought her jackets, women's jacket. We, we did not care, you know, we wanted a jacket. So we were in New York, my friend and I wearing these women's jackets, you know, <laughs> walking around, probably looking crazy. Um, and so we started to go out and experience what New York was, and um, uh, we became friends, this woman and I, and then I returned to Sierra Leone after the conference. Um, and the war reached the capital city, and my life fell apart again, and my uncle was sick, and he basically passed away in my arms because the war had reached the capital city and all the hospitals had been burnt down and everything, so there was nowhere to take him to get him any medicine. And I was really devastated. Um, and I did not want to be re recruited a second time around again. This happened to some of my friends. Because I had this passport, and I'd been exposed out a little bit, I knew I could try something. Uh, but when you leave your country in times of war, you cannot tell, say goodbye to people because it may create jealousy and people may give you up to something. So basically one morning I just walked down the hill and then turned around and decided to leave my country. Uh, it was very difficult. Um, I was, at this point I think I was about 17. You know, I walked all the way halfway to Guinea, which is the next door country, you know. Uh, I didn't have any money, so I basically... <laughs> went into the country legally. So I went from Guinea, uh, and this book ends when I'm in Guinea. Uh, but from Guinea, I went to Burkina Faso. I went all the way to Ivory Coast. I went all the way to South Africa, Cape Town. <laughs> um, and I was just moving, you know. I did not want to stay anywhere where I could get compromised. Uh, and throughout this period, I would try one American embassy here to get a visa, and I would be rejected. In those days, when you're rejected, they put a stamp at the back of your passport to say you were rejected. So when you go somewhere, they look at it, and they put another one. Now, why you let me explain why I was rejected last time. I actually have another. <laughs> anyway, eventually, I was able to convince somebody at the American embassy in Cote d'Ivoire, where I returned again from South Africa, to um, give me a visa. And this fellow basically said to me that, you know, I could lose my job um, because you know, your country has been put on the quota, we cannot give you a visa. And I said, well, I could lose my life. You know, um, If you don't give me the visa, I have a family that's willing to take to adopt me. If you don't give me a visa, I would not have the chance of having a life. If you refuse that visa, I will go back to Syria. And chances are I'll probably jump right back in the war. Um, so it's up to you. So basically, I gave him more dilemma that he could not undo. <laughs> And he said, I shouldn't have given you the chance to tell me why I should give you a visa. Because now I feel responsible for your life. I was like, exactly, that was my point. This is what I've been trying to. <laughs> so he gave me what he could give me, which was a prospective student visa, which meant that I would arrive in New York and my family, the um, Jewish family that had adopted this Muslim boy, had a war background, would arrive and I would get into a school and then my status would change. Now, 
the rub of it was that it was in the summer, so all the schools were closed. And I had basically three months to find a school. So basically, you know, we went to all the vacation homes of the principals, school principals, and my mom would say, you know, my very bossy Jewish mom would say, he's a really good kid, you should talk to him. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I don't know what I have to say to this fellow, but all right. And some schools did not take me because I did not have a report card. That was it. Can you show us you've been in school? I said, yes, I know I've been in school. I said, but you have a report card. Again, not something that you're really thinking about when you're running from war. You're not saying, oh, report card. I may end up in New York someday. I may need it. You know, this is fascinating. <laughs> so anyway, um, and this is when I started to write. Uh, because since everybody was asking for this report card, I decided to write an essay. And this was my first piece of serious writing. And it, the title was, Why I Do Not Have a Report Card. <laughs> and in that essay, I explained that some people don't have report cards, particularly me, because of these things. Uh, this essay uh, um, got me a scholarship to the United Nations International School. Um, and my life started to turn out. But I, then I saw something. There was a, so, an, an inkling that, for me, my life had been shattered so much that I had no physical proof of my previous existence anymore. But I had words. I could write through imagery. I could bring back those things alive. So the next stage was that for the yearbook in my, in my school, everybody was asked to bring a baby picture. I was the only student who could not provide one. It was a very painful experience, but I thought, you know what? Let's imagine how I may have looked like as a baby, and let's write a poem. <laughs> so I wrote a poem about how I imagine I may have been a baby. My friends who did not know, again, when I got taken to this school, just for context, uh, most of my schoolmates did not know that I had been a former child soldier because it was agreed that they were not ready to receive the information. So they just thought I was this kid who lived in the East Village in New York, where my family lived, my uh, adoptive family. And so when my mother would show up, white Jewish woman, they would say, so what happened? And I was like, well, you know, what do you think happened? And people would jump to conclusions. Did she go to Sierra Leone and met your, mother, your father? I was like, that's it. So whatever somebody says, I agreed with it, because then I would not have to explain myself. You know, so they had all these different versions. And so um, to them, what, the fact that I could not provide a baby picture, they could not comprehend it. So they said, you must have been a really ugly baby. This is why you don't want to to bring your baby picture. I said, all right, sure, that, that, is, that is a possibility. So I wrote this poem and put it where my photo could have gone if I had one. So again, I saw an opportunity for me to use words as a way to build back everything that I'd lost, things that I didn't have physically. Um, I went to university. I was studying political science and preparing for law school. Um, but I was very upset at a lot of things. Um, and this is how the writing of the book came about. Um, I was upset at the way my country, Sierra Leone, was being portrayed in the media, uh, and also how children, former child soldiers, were being spoken of about. The first was that, for the context of Sierra Leone, because most people had come to learn about this country only during the time of that war, that became the only way we were spoken about. Sierra Leone, that place with amputation, blood diamond, madness, and I'm saying, thinking to myself, there's so much more. Yes, that is part of Sierra Leone's history, but that is not the only thing. What about all the other context that shows who we are before the war and even after the war? That was not part of the discussion. So I wanted to give a human context to the story. So I was obsessed. So I decided to start thinking about how, how do I do this? Um, the second part that really angered me was uh, many years ago, there were a few people who came up to this conclusion through whatever research they did, that children like us, um, at the time, I'm no longer a child, but <laughs> who had gone through that experience, uh, would no longer be able to function as normal beings in their lives. That we were basically the lost generation, damaged. And here I was in New York, in schools and in university, at the top of my class, doing well. I still had issues with trauma from time to time, but I was doing well. I hadn't been in school as consistently as some students, but I was beating them in class. And I was like, what about that part of the story? I'm, I certainly did not feel like a lost person at all, <laughs> a lost generation. Uh, I understood things way deeper than 
people who were my age understood. Um, and so this really angered me and I decided I needed to write to prepare myself for a debate if I had a chance. So I was thinking from the point of view of a lawyer, a politician, I mean, I'm a, a political scientist. So I started to write this book with no intention of publishing it. Uh, by the time I graduated from my undergraduate, I had completed this book uh, and I did not want to publish it at all. It was very personal, but it was also the first time that I allowed myself to go into the experience on my own terms. And I learned certain things about myself, so I thought that was sufficient. I knew certain things that I didn't know before, and I thought, you know, if I had children, I would always give this to them if they want to know about their father. So for me, this was the desire. And then some people convinced me that you should show it to this publisher, that publisher, and reluctantly I did, and some of them liked it, and they decided that they wanted to publish it. Uh, some of them had uh, editorial comments that I completely disliked. They did not like context. They wanted me to write about just the madness because there was this desire to see only the gore from the war in Sierra Leone, to see only one side of that dehumanization. You know, if you read this book, you see that I spent so much, the part about the war is very short. It's very difficult to read, but it's very short because I wanted to explain that this was not a book about celebrating violence, but rather an insight into how violence consumes human nature, human beings, but more importantly, how we can recover from it the resilience that the human spirit has to come out of it. So I found a publisher that was willing to follow that. And I thought to myself, well, maybe when it comes out, at least people in the NGO community or <laughs> some professors teaching some conflict somewhere would buy it. So I get a few hundred copies sold somewhere. I completely was, before even the book came out, um, the New York Times decided to do an excerpt. Uh, from the book, so I edited it and gave it to them. And I went to see this photographer, everything was new to me, who took my photo, and he basically made this expression that you should invest in the in sunglasses and a hat. And I thought to myself, all right, I'm still young in America, I don't understand some expressions, eventually I would. So I was living in Brooklyn, and one morning I jumped on the train to come into the city to see my family. I'm not joking, literally everybody sitting across from the other side of the train from me had the New York Times Sunday magazine with my face on the cover. <laughs> so I understood exactly what that fellow meant. I was like, oh, this is the hat and the sunglasses moment, you know. So I got off and bought a hat and sunglasses and sat. But from time to time, people, when the book finally came out, people would be reading it, I'll be on the, on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the train or on the plane or anywhere, and people will be reading me, you know, I would know exactly where they are in the book based on their body language. And they would, they would turn it around like this and they would look up and they would see me and they would look at it. <laughs> because for them, it was not even believable that I was sitting across from them in New York City. And then they would say to me, where are you from? And I would say, Brooklyn. <laughs> and they would say, no, 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 but before that, and I was like, and I would generalize, Africa. And they'd be like, where in Africa? You know, and I'd play games with them a little bit. And, and if I don't tell them, they will say, you know, there's this fellow from Sierra Leone who wrote this book, Ishmael He looks so much like you. And I was like, I'm always getting that. What, what is this fellow? And then they will give me a review of my own book in front of me, which is really fascinating. <laughs> and I will say, I think I'll pick it up and read it. It sounds like a fascinating book. <laughs> and I'm like, you should read it. The older people really insist, you should read it, young man. This will teach you something about us. <laughs> Sure, I will, I will do that, you know. Um, but so the book went on, first week it came out, it went on immediately to the New York Times bestseller list. And my life went from this small boy who came from a small village in West Africa, who by chance left that war, got adopted, uh, to now this internationally known writer. And I, and I didn't know what to do with that. I wasn't prepared for it. But I knew one thing that the story that I'd written, even though it was about me, was about an issue that was far greater than who I am than my life. So that's really what kept me grounded because I knew I'd not written it for myself, but for the other young people who, even as I speak to you, who have this issue in their lives. For people not to forget them, but people to see the possibilities that exist if you give them the chance to come out of these experiences. So I try to keep my head down to not allow things to get to me in that sense because, you know, 
you can easily get flopped for be like, I'm a famous writer. <laughs> so, so then I started doing things that really upset people, you know, because when you become a known writer now, they send cars to pick you up. And I'll take the subway, it was faster. I liked watching people, you know. <laughs> and I would arrive wherever I was going, people would get really upset, but the driver's waiting for you there. I'd be like, well, so he can drive back, you know, <laughs> it's okay, you know, it's not the worst thing. But, um, and then uh, my life took away from there. I went on to write another book and but I didn't think this was sufficient. I thought to myself, all right, now I have a voice in the world that people want to hear. Uh, I, what do I do with it more than just writing a book? Uh, at first, I decided to start a foundation in my country, which was basically geared towards giving educational opportunities to people like I'd been given to, uh, and finding people Mentorship, I said, all the things that had happened to me, I wanted to provide to other people so they can see what they can do with it. And so I took proceeds from this book, basically. Uh, each copy that sold, two dollars from each copy that sold, um, was put into this foundation. And luckily the book sold a lot, over a million copies in the US, so that made a good amount of money, uh, both for the foundation and for me, uh, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> rightly so. Um, so but that was insufficient enough. I thought to myself, okay, I studied political science, how do I get engaged in the international community about how decisions are made to deal with children? So hence, I pursued uh, something with the United Nations and I was appointed UNICEF first advocate for children affected by war. It's a mouthful, war and conflict. What this does is that I sat at the table and participated in the creation of various international protocols, legal standards, norms that prevent uh, the use of children in armed conflict. Uh, so I will go whether to Washington, France, or different places uh, uh, at this, uh, the AU, and talk about what we can do together based on my experience, but also based on field experience. One of the things that I do also is that I go in the field. Uh, I don't just stop at the places and meet young people who are still carrying weapons all over the world. So whether I was in Sri Lanka, whether I was in Colombia, whether in South Sudan, uh, in Central African Republic, and meet young people, and sometimes have been a part of negotiations where you have UNICEF child protection specialists, the people who had released me from the war who do this work. They actually go and talk to the commanders and convince them to release the children from their ranks. Uh, my wife actually does this work, so <laughs> I've gone on things with her. And, but also what is really important and fulfilling is that when I'm in the, on these particular missions, when children are being released, uh, and I talk to them, um, I explain to them how they are feeling and that it's okay the way they are feeling, and they look at me and say, how did you know that? And I say, well, you know, I used to. And then they calm down a little bit. So I have all these little brothers and sisters all over the world who then would tell me, but you were in the war for three years, I was there for five years, and you came out and you did this and that, I'm gonna do better. And I say, good, that's what I want. So I've had these moments that have been really rewarding. It's difficult to be in those environments, but it's been really rewarding to go on the ground uh, and share and this stuff. But, and I'll tell you one last story and then we open it up to uh, questions. Is that uh, two small anecdotes. So for the first book, when I was in um, Central African Republic, we went on a mission to negotiate the release of some kids from, from an armed group that's no, no longer in existence there. And the fellow we were supposed to talk to had been really reluctant to uh, meet with the UN or UNICEF in particular. And all of a sudden I was coming and he said, yes, I will sit with you guys. And they said, well, what, what, what changed? What, 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 what came about? He said, I know of this Ishmael Bear fellow. <laughs> I saw him on French TV and this and that. I said, all right. I did not know that warlords were watching what I was doing, but this was really interesting. So we arrived in the middle of nowhere in Central African Republic. Now, I give you context. When you, the UN uh, missions go really deep into the heart of certain places where you basically take this old Cold War uh, planes from the Cold War that probably will not be satisfied to fly anywhere else in the world, but in those areas, <laughs> uh, flown by guys from the Cold War. <laughs> <laughs> and the night before, you were hearing them singing Mother Russia songs uh, next door to your room. And there's the guy on the pilot, be like, all right, fine, we'll get there, we'll do something, we may not get there. 
and you go to these places to land, where basically it's like a dirt patch. So before you land, they call the walkie to the guy who says, well, you know, I think it's dry enough to land. <laughs> All right, it's really going well. You know, so you land and then you take these vehicles, you get stuck in mud, the vehicles like this sometimes, almost your head is touching the ground, the roads are bad, and then you get to these places, and this fellow has this book with him. And that really blew my mind. I thought to myself, I never imagined that audience when I was writing the book. So obviously he went to see them, oh, you know, but you know what you wrote, this is really good, but you know, why are you telling them all the secrets? And he said, <laughs> I'm not from Central African Republic, so I don't know what you're talking about, you know, anyway. Uh, but these help at times with negotiations because it broke the ice and that person was able to work with the United Nations very effectively. Um, the last story that I will tell you, which is an interesting story, is that how you translate um, these sort of experiences I've lived with other people that don't have any idea where this is about. When I was in, in school in the United States, in New York, in high school, I made friends with a group of kids um, um, you know, whose families were very well to do. They'd never experienced, even though they thought they, they were very tough, because they lived in New York City, it's a tough city, they would tell me and remind me, and train me to be tough in New York. They did not know anything about my background, I said nothing. And then one day they decided that they were gonna invite me to do something that was an American pastime. They said, you must, you're gonna love this. And I said, what is this? They said, it's called paintball. We need to go play paintball. I had never heard of paintball in my life, actually. So we went upstate New York. One of the kids, his family had a whole thing. So I'm sure you all know what paintball is. Basically, you dress, you get the, <laughs> anyway. So we arrived, and I was back in war mode again. But it was very interesting for me to observe the kids. You know, I have in the evening, everybody went to sleep. And while they were sleeping, I got up and went in the terrain and marked everything. I knew how many steps it took to get there, to where this was, that was. I was back, preparation, preparation, war 101. <laughs> I was ready for them the next morning. So they said to me, oh, let's teach you how to shoot the thing. I said, yeah, sure. I'm off for some lessons, so we shot the ball. And they said, okay, we're gonna play one, and we go, and I'm just, I'm just taking it to them. And they're like, you sure you've never played paintball before? I said, no, I have not, which was true. I have not played paintball before. I've played something similar to it. But, <laughs> but what was really funny is how I saw how their idea of war was this playful thing. Um, for them, it was a child's play. They would roll around, they had their face dark, and they would do these kinds of things. And it was really amazing to observe it. And what I really wanted to tell them was that you're so lucky that this is the only, the only violence you experience in your life is one you pretend to play at. And I wish this would be the same for any child in the world, that I would never change, you know? Um, at some point I had to sit out because nobody was winning, so to so make the game fun for them. So. But they never invited me to play again. Uh, my, my Jewish mother freaked out when she heard I was playing. I was like, <laughs> I know the difference between the real war and this one, but it was really interesting to observe that. And that has stayed with me over the years, uh, just, uh, which is one of the importance of writing this book, is really to show people the difference between pretend play at war and the reality of violence whether it's verbal, whether it's war, you cannot undo it. Once you, you know, uh, in a video game, a character dies, you can restart. In real life, it's not possible. And when you dehumanize somebody else, if you survived, you realize one thing, that when you dehumanize somebody in reverse, you dehumanize yourself. And if you stay alive, you have to undo that dehumanization for yourself and the person you dehumanize. And, that is a very difficult task. So thank you uh, for listening to me so far. Um, we are going to open it up to questions, I believe, at some point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.